101.1 FM and AM 1160. He is Indiana County District Attorney Bob Manzi joining us in the studio this morning and also available on Facebook for you this morning at the WCCS Facebook page. Good morning to you. Hey, good morning. How are you today? Wonderful. Good to have you with us. Our conversation brought to you by Marcus and Mac, a law firm representing injured people. Summer months, so oh, nothing going on in the courthouse, is there? My goodness. <laughs> great. We're, we're back to trials now, aren't we? Back to trials. Uh you know, normally our schedule is we have criminal trials one week a month mm -hmm. um, just because of the COVID and the backlog that's going on throughout the state. We're now doing criminal trials two weeks every month. Uh, so we're, we're anywhere between four and six trials every month that we're able to get through. So yeah. as many people in the county are getting their jury summons in the mail, they know that, uh, you know, we're getting going. So we just had a couple trials complete uh, just the other week. Uh, one was a jury trial. Uh, for a child molestation case, we had a jury come in. It was a three-day trial, uh, and that defendant was convicted on all charges, uh, and he'll be sentenced in November. Uh, the other trial, we had an inmate down at SEI uh, Pine Grove assault the uh, one of the workers there. Mm -hmm. um, ended up picking the jury, and then he pled guilty to all the charges. Yeah. So uh, I'm not exactly sure why he wanted to pick the jury. Maybe it got him out of the prison for the day, but <laughs> he ended up pleading guilty to everything anyway. So yeah. Um, but, you know, we're still going to go on. We have, uh, you know, we're lining up trials for August, and we're going to have mm -hmm. more trials. So, you know, we just appreciate, uh, you know, when we summon people for jury, we'll see hundreds of people come in, uh, and they take that duty seriously. They're there to hear the evidence. They hear it fairly. Um, so it's very interesting to see people who may not want to have that jury summons come in, uh, but they, when they come, they come and take it very seriously, and we appreciate that. How long do you anticipate it will take before we whittle down the list of trials that are pending until we have the, the normal number of trials? I, I think we'll be there towards the end of the year, maybe into next year. Mm -hmm. uh, when we look across the state, our numbers are very good compared to some other counties. Uh, there's other counties that they've just started jury trials for the first time since March of last year. Mm -hmm. So their backlog is in the thousands. Yeah. Um, you know, we're under a hundred. We're for, for the size of our County and the size of our caseload, we're doing very well when you look around at all of our neighbors. I note as well, when you look at the appellate uh, cases involving Indiana County defendants, some of the uh, high-profile homicide defendants uh, that Indiana County has had convicted here in, in recent years, uh, they're before the appellate courts right now pursuing that. And I just think I, you pointed out because uh, it's good that people know that uh, this, this whole criminal justice system is a system and uh, the people will take advantage of it, as, as they should, and Indiana County is doing its due diligence. I know the Bowen case is there. Uh, the Stevenson case is there. DeAndre Jones, his case is there. Uh, the Weiss case goes back to Superior Court for review. Correct. Uh, so all of these things are still going on at the appellate court level, too. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're still working. We still have cases, um, Di Stefano, that's still at the appellate level going up to the Supreme Court. Uh, we have Nick Price that's still in the appellate level, and those are pretrials uh, before. So, yeah, cases are, are still uh, moving around the system and, and getting their due attention. Yeah, so all of that is going on, still picking juries at KCAC? Still picking juries at KCAC from, for right now. I'm not sure how that's going to change, if that's going to change in the coming months. Mm -hmm. uh, but that has worked very well. Uh, we have plenty of room to space out there. All the jurors have said they feel very comfortable and they feel safe, yeah. which is important. If we're asking people to come in, we want to make sure it's done in, in a safe way that they're comfortable. People probably feel pretty good about parking there as well. A lot of good as parking. To downtown. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's always something to, to take note of. Uh, other things that are happening. Mental health has always been an aspect uh, that I know that you and, and people who are within the system uh, are well aware is is very very important. Uh, uh, the general population might know that it's very important, but not know how it gets done. Indiana County has taken a step forward in that aspect of things, hasn't it? We've taken a huge step forward in addressing mental health concerns in the criminal justice system. So, working with the Armstrong Indiana Behavioral uh, Health Program uh, and our Criminal Justice Advisory Board, uh, we were able to obtain a grant to pay for a law enforcement liaison, and we've talked about that in the past. Uh, well, that law enforcement liaison is in place. That's Emily Fiox. She's working at the Community Guidance Center, and she's, she's working full-time. She's getting it done. What we have is now a system where if we have a case that may truly be a mental health case and not a case proper for the criminal justice system, uh, let's say an individual with 
an incredibly low IQ uh, who may be addressing those concerns are better done in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. um, we can now refer that case to Emily. She's in touch with all of our systems here in Indiana County and surrounding counties. We're able to make sure that programming and treatments in place for that individual to stop what they were doing in the past, make sure they're getting treated and addressed. And, and it's something where that individual really would not have gained anything and a community would not have gained anything by them being in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. uh, just sticking them in jail uh, with a 50 IQ is really not going to help anybody involved. Yeah. But now having Emily and her team uh, addressing those mental health concerns, we stop those actions that are drawing the attention of law enforcement and we're helping that individual live a better life with the treatment aspects in place. Yeah. yeah. So this is, to me, a very important way. You know, we always talk about mental health. Uh, mental health has been talked about in the criminal justice system for many years. We've taken a giant step forward. And we're not saying this is the end all, but it is a very big step forward in addressing that. And people might mistakenly think that um, public safety would be compromised in some way by moving it into this sort of a, of a procedure rather than uh, the basic criminal justice procedure. But the public is protected at all times. Public is protected, I would say, even more with these systems in place because we have individuals that they may not be uh, appropriate or even permitted to be in the jail. Maybe they're, uh, you know, we had one, one defendant I, I know of, one suspect, a 50 IQ. They're probably not going to the jail, so mm -hmm. they're probably going to end up being released on a bond. But with that program in place, that person's now in a group home supervised by staff 24-7 instead of just being at home, being able to do what they were doing before. Yeah. Um, so actually what it is is it's providing more protections because now they have more people supervising them around the clock and they have treatment aspects in place that are addressing what their needs are. So I believe they're actually more secure. We're talking with Indiana County District Attorney Bob Manzi this morning on Indiana in the Morning as we approach the uh, bottom of the hour in our next update of news. When we think about uh, summertime, uh, there are certainly aspects or characteristics of summertime that maybe another portion of the year you would not have as much of. One of those is, and I know the state police have uh, really increased their efforts to stop drunk driving. Um, when uh, I said to you before, when you look at the DUI criminal call list and you see that it's uh, literally over 100 names every month, uh, you know it's a big problem. Uh, those people getting behind the wheel of a car after they've been drinking, it's, it's a very, very dangerous situation. I know that concerns you uh, during the summer months especially. It concerns me a great deal. You know, we've, we've all been stuck in our homes for the last year with COVID. Everybody wants to get out. I want to get out. Uh, we all want to see our friends and family. Mm -hmm. The weather's beautiful. People are going out more, having a couple drinks. And, and I'm not opposed to that. I'm just, I want them to make sure they have somebody driving them home. Uh, I don't want to have more cases. I urge people to not drink and drive because I want to have less cases. I want people to get home safely and move on with their lives. Uh, and it doesn't take as much as people might think. Uh, you know, you're sitting out in a hot day all day long having a few drinks. You're dehydrating because of the sun. You're maybe not eating. Uh, and, and all of the effects of the alcohol get exacerbated. And now you're driving home thinking, I'm only going a mile or two. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, you're in a DUI accident. You're hurt. You hurt somebody else. God forbid somebody's killed. It's simply not worth it. Yeah. So I'm really urging people to take the steps appropriate to say, if you're going to be out, make sure you have somebody who's sober to drive. Much of uh, the DUI criminal call list these days as well, um, and an increasing percentage of it has to do with people taking controlled substances as opposed to drinking alcohol. And not that alcohol isn't a controlled substance, uh, but illegal substances, uh, that's becoming an increasing problem. And testing for it is much more difficult as well, is it not? It is. I mean, you know, we all know the effects of alcohol and the signs of alcohol, but not most civilians know the, what to look for, somebody on methamphetamine or heroin. Fortunately, we have great law enforcement in this county that are specially trained to be able to view indicators for intoxication of controlled substances and drivers, um, you know, through special training. So we're able to detect that, we're able to stop that. And, and to piggyback that, what we see is an increasing amount of people who have medical marijuana cards mm -hmm. who are then driving. And what they need to understand is even if you have a medical marijuana card, you cannot operate a motor vehicle with THC in your system. 
Yeah. Whether you have a medical marijuana card or not, it is illegal to drive a vehicle in Pennsylvania with marijuana in your system, period. It's not a hall pass. It is, it is not a hall pass. It is, you know, it's very different when there's other medicine that a doctor may prescribe you and can say, well, you're okay to take this and to drive. With marijuana, there is no allowance. Mm-hmm. So even if you have a medical marijuana card, and some people do view it as, well, I have a card, I'm allowed to. If you have a medical marijuana card, you are not allowed to drive a car with marijuana in your system, period. We are prosecuting people for that. It is still illegal in Pennsylvania. East District Attorney Bob Manzi joining us this morning. A couple of more minutes. Um, we had a story of another scam alert this morning. This one involved uh, somebody trying to steal somebody's unemployment benefits. Um, and uh, we've had other scam reports uh, up and down the game. I mean, there's just so much of it out there, people trying to get into your pocket. And, and as I said this morning when we were talking uh, on the air, uh, it doesn't matter how vigilant you are. Sometimes people are, are scamming you and you don't even know it. Um, just being aware of your record keeping and, and of uh, what's out there and, and what the challenge is, is, is a really difficult thing right now. It is very tough. And, and the scammers are getting more and more sophisticated as we're learning about it. They're learning about it as well to see what they can get away with. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are scams that we're seeing where, uh, they'll start debiting people's credit cards for smaller amounts of money. And unless you go through your credit card bill line by line, you may have somebody scamming your credit card on a monthly basis where they charge your credit card an amount where maybe it doesn't really raise your eyebrows, mm-hmm. $40, $50, $20. And you think, oh, I, maybe I got gas or maybe I stopped at sheets. If you don't go line by line through your accounts, that may already be happening to you without you knowing. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the interesting things is uh, as we become more and more or less and less cash-oriented as a society, that means that the number of charges on a credit card are going to increase. And as they mass up, uh, the chance that one of those charges or two or three in a, in a month, course of a month are, are bogus, uh, they go up too. Oh, absolutely. And, and certainly you would notice a $1,000 charge on your credit card. That would really draw your attention. But for a lot of people, a $20 charge might not mean much. And if the scammers are doing that across the board to thousands of people, they're making a lot of money without really drawing people's attention. So, you know, go through your records, go through your, your credit cards or your Apple Pays or all the various electronic payments you're, you're using and make sure there's not scams going in there. And if they are, you want to make sure to bring it to the attention of their credit card uh, and dispute that. And typically they'll They'll help you out there. Yeah, sit down for a half an hour each month, and, and it, could, it could pay big dividends. It could, it could pay a lot of money back to you. Last thing I wanted to ask you about today, because I know you're quite concerned about this as well. When you get to the summertime months, so the possibility that people will leave children or pets in a locked car in the summer heat, there are laws against that now. There's Not only are there laws against it, but it, it is scary how fast the inside of a car gets when you shut the door and it's 90, 80, 80 degrees, 90 degrees, 100 degrees out. Uh, it does not take long for that car to get dangerously and life-threateningly hot. Uh, so, you know, take, take precautions. If you need to put a purse or a bag in your back seat or if you need to, you know, whatever it is you need to do, mm-hmm. uh, we really urge everyone to uh, check your car and make sure no one's left there. Certainly do not leave your children in there. Uh, we have heard of people who think, well, I'm only running in the store for two minutes. And you know what? That two minutes turns into five minutes because you see somebody you know or the line's long. And, and the damage that can be done, especially to small infants and to animals, uh, does not take long at all. So yeah. we urge people, do not leave any children, any animals in hot cars. He is Indiana County District Attorney Bob Manzi. Thanks for the visit this morning. Thank you very much. I always appreciate being here. It is the voice of Indiana County WCCS, 101.1 FM and AM 1160. Boomer is next. He's got the CBS Sports Minute.